I'm Humberto Rosas. I'm a professor of Latino studies and anthropology here at UIUC, University of Illinois. I'm here with colleagues, students, and people who are here to read the, the books that have been banned in Arizona. We are in solidarity with brothers and sisters out in Arizona, and we will not be silenced. Um, my name is Mariana Garcia, and I am a representative of the Graduate Organization of Latina and Latino Students. And I will be reading um, a part from Gloria Antaldúa's Borderlands, La Frontera, The New Mestiza. To live in the borderlands means you are neither Hispana, India, Negra, Española, ni Gavacha. It is Mestiza, Mulata, half-breed, caught in the crossfire between camps while carrying all five races on your back, not knowing which side to run to, run from. To live in the borderlands means knowing that the India you betrayed for 500 years ago is no longer speaking to you, that Mexicanas call you rajetas, that denying the Anglo inside, inside you is as bad as having denied the Indian or black. Cuando vives en la frontera, people walk through you, the wind steals your voice, you're a burra, waste, scapegoat, forerunner of a new race, half and half, both women and men, neither a new gender. To live in the borderlands means to put chile in the box, eat whole wheat tortillas, speak Tex-Mex with a Brooklyn accent, be stopped by La Migra at the border checkpoints. Living in the borderlands means you fight hard to resist the gold elixir beckoning from the bottle, the pool of the gun barrel, the rope crushing the hollow of your throat. In the borderlands, you are the battleground, where enemies are akin to each other. You are at home a stranger. The border disputes have been settled. The volley of shots have shattered the truce. You are wounded, lost in action, dead, fighting back. To live in the borderlands means the mill with the razor, white teeth wants to shred off your olive red skin, crush you out the kernel, your heart. Pound you pinch, you roll you out, smelling like white bread but dead. To survive the borderlands, you must live in fronteras, be a crossroads. Hi, my name is Joanna Perez and I'm here representing uh, La Colectiva and also the Graduate Organization for Latina Latino Students in solidarity with our sisters and brothers in Arizona. Um, and I will be reading Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Animated by authentic humanist, not humanitarian generosity, presents itself as a pedagogy of humankind. Pedagogy which begins with the egoistic interest of the oppressors. An egoism cloaked in the false generosity of paternalism and makes of the oppressed the objects of its humanitarianism. It self-maintains and embodies oppression. It is an instrument of dehumanization. This is why, as we affirmed earlier, the pedagogy of the oppressed cannot be developed or practiced by the oppressors. It would be a contradiction in terms of the oppressors not only defended, but actually implemented a liberating education. But if the implementation of a liberating education requires political power and the oppressed have none, how then is it possible to carry out the pedagogy of the oppressed prior to the revolution? In the second stage, in which the reality of the oppression has already been transformed, this pedagogy ceases to belong to the oppressed and becomes a pedagogy of all people in the process of permanent liberation. In both stages, it is always through action in depth that the culture of domination is culturally confronted. I'm reading The House on Mango Street by Sandra Cisneros. In English, my name means hope. In Spanish, it means too many letters. It means <coughs> sadness. It means waiting. It is like the number nine, a moody color. It is the Mexican records my father plays on Sunday mornings when he is shaving. Songs like sobbing. It was my great-grandmother's name, and now it is mine. She was a horse woman too, born like me in the Chinese year of the horse, which is supposed to be bad luck if you're born female. But I think this is a Chinese lie because the Chinese, like the Mexicans, don't like their women to be strong. My great-grandmother, I would have liked to have known her. A wild horse of a woman, so wild she wouldn't marry until my great-grandfather threw a sack over her head and carried her off, just like that, as if she were a fancy chandelier. That's the way he did it. And the story goes, she never forgave him. She looked out the window her whole life, the way so many women sit their sadness on an elbow. I wonder if she made the best with what she got, or was she sorry because she couldn't be all the things she wanted to be. Esperanza. I have inherited her name, but I won't, do not want to inherit her place by the window. At school, they say my name funny, as if the syllables hurt the roof of your mouth. 
but in Spanish, my name is made out of the softer, some, something like silver, not quite as thick as the sister's name, Magdalena, which is uglier than mine. Magdalena, who is at least, can come home and become nanny, but I am always Esperanza. I would like to baptize myself under a new name, a name more like the real me, the one nobody sees, Esperanza as Lisandra or Maritza or Cece, the ex. Yes, something like Cece, the ex will do. Good evening, my name is Thomas Garza, and I'm going to be reading from De Calores, means all of us. Disdain for mixture haunts and inhibits U.S. culture because it does not recognize hybridism. This country's racial framework emphasizes separateness and offers no grounds for mutual inclusion. As the child of Mexican and Anglo parents, I remember growing up haunted by that dreaded word half-breed, meaning me. Today, mestice, mixing, is still seen by the dominant society as indicating a polluted or at least problematic bloodline rather than a source of cultural richness. The hybrid is mysteriously un-American. The mainstream culture doesn't deal comfortably with complex ideas of peoples, and Latinos are highly complex in every way. In addition to biological and cultural complexity, Chicanos and Chicanas have a complex political identity. They were born from a process of Spain colonizing Mexico, then became colonizers themselves in what is now the Southwest, only to be colonized again by other whites. They are both indigenous and immigrant. For 150 years, people moving north from Mexico did not feel they were going to a foreign country. The land had been Mexico, and in many ways it remained so. Nothing spoke of a real border, not the landscape, nor the people, nor the culture. Only in the 1920s did checkpoints and border control begin to institutionalize a separateness. Psychologically and culturally, the Southwest remains today, for many Mexicans, a Mexican nation within an Anglo nation. What do critical race theorists believe? Probably not every member would subscribe to every tenet set out in this book. But many would agree with the following propositions. First, that racism is ordinary, not aboriginal. Normal science, the usual way society does business, the common, everyday experience of most people of color in this country. Second, most would agree that our system of white over color ascendancy serves important purposes, both psychic and material. The first feature, ordinariness, means that racism is difficult to cure or address. Colorblind or formal conceptions of equality expressed in rules that insist only on treatment that in the same way across the board can thus remedy only the most blatant forms of discrimination, such as mortgage red redlining or the refusal to hire a black PhD rather than a white high school, high school dropout that do stand out and attract our attention. The second feature, sometimes called interest convergence or material determinism at the further dimension. Because racism advances the interests of both white elites materially and working class people psychically. Large segments of society have had little incentive to eradicate it. A third theme of critical race theory, the social construction thesis, holds that race and racists are part of the social thought and relations, not objective, inherent, or fixed, they correspond to no biological or genetic reality. Rather, races are categories that society invents, manipulates, or retires when convenient. I am Corinta Maldonado, and I'm going to read La Lucha Continua, Youth in the Lead. Nosotros, los huérfanos de oportunidades, nos hemos atrevido a traspasar la puerta abierta por los zapatistas y entrar al otro lado del espejo, donde todas y todos podemos ser iguales porque somos diferentes, donde no tiene que haber solo una manera de vivir, donde se conjuga el rechazo al sistema actual, con el deseo de construir un mundo donde quepan muchos mundos. We are the orphans of opportunity, have dared to pass through the door opened by the zapatistas, and cross the other side of the mirror, where everyone can be the same because we are different. Where there can be more than one way of living, where rejection of the present system exists together with the desire to build, to build a new world, in which many worlds fit, will fit. Palabras Zapatistas de Luceta Guinea.